Let's go back to Revelation chapter number 1. Appreciate the good testimonies. Praise the Lord for it. It's good to be saved by the grace of God. And uh, certainly want to be a light and a witness to those around us. We go back. I struggled a little bit. I, I want to finish the, the series of messages I've been preaching on the church. And I've got at least one more. It's looking like it may develop into more than one more, but um, we'll get back to it. Amen. It's God's Word. It'll keep. Truth doesn't change. And uh, so we'll just uh, put it off a little bit longer. But I felt like we need to come back and finish this thought while it's fresh on our heart. And uh, so we'll go back to where we were this morning and uh, try to finish up the message as the Lord has directed us. Stand with me, if you will. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 9. Read two verses here, and then we'll get in to the rest of the passage in just a moment. <clears throat> the Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you to help us, Lord. Guard my lips to say everything I ought to say, nothing I shouldn't. I pray that you'd get glory out of this service, out of all that's done. Thank you for the great testimonies. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that we're saved by your grace on our way to heaven. Thank you for being a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Thank you, Lord, for a burden that you place upon our heart to witness and to see lost souls saved. Lord, I pray that you would take each testimony, each prayer, each song that's been sung. Lord, bring them together now. And Lord, tie them with the message to give us a complete service that would glorify you. Help us, I pray, shine as only you can, and we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This morning, and everyone pretty well knows this morning, dealt with uh, the thought out of verse number 10 of being in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Certainly, we have agreed, we agreed this morning that uh, it is a good thing to be in the Spirit. Now, as much as the Bible says about being filled with the Spirit, about being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, grieving not the Spirit, certainly we would agree it is a good thing to be in the Spirit. We also agreed this morning that the Lord's day is a special special day. It's a day we long for, a day we look forward to all week long. So if we're going to be in the Spirit, uh, then certainly the Lord's Day would be a very special day to be in the Spirit. And so we, we desire in my own heart to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I wonder what would transform in our services if we all would come together in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And certainly I believe that many times we have at least a vast majority of people have come together in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Uh, but uh, I wonder if there's ever been a service where every person in the congregation could be said to be in the Spirit. That word in means to be have, have given holy to the Spirit. So to give yourself holy to the Spirit, uh, to have His influence. We talked about that being filled, the influence of the Holy Spirit, the permeation of the Holy Spirit, to have Him in every particle of your being, the domination of the Holy Spirit, to have Him in absolute control. Would it not be a wonderful thing for all of the congregation to be absolutely in the Spirit on the Lord's day when we come to the Lord's house. We dealt with several things, and I'll not take time to mention them. We'll get right to the heart of the message. Finish this morning with the first point that we find in Revelation chapter number 1, as, as John here is in the Spirit, and what he found out, he found out that being in the Spirit on the Lord's day will cause you to hear things like you've never heard them before. Talked about the fact that he heard a trumpet and all the things that that symbolized. We talked about the great truth that he heard. Secondly, I want to bring your attention to this and finish up the message. John, being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, not only realized he could hear things he'd never heard before, but he realized he could see things that he had never seen before. Being in the Spirit on the Lord's day will cause us to see things like never before. Notice what the Bible said in verse number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake 
spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, and white, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet dead, as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are... The these seven churches. Here, John tells us, being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, caused him to see something that he had never seen before. Now, I'm going to speculate just a little bit. We have the book of Revelation. We have John's account of all that the Lord showed him when he was in the Isle of Patmos. And I wonder if John ever got over what he saw. I wonder if John ever got over what he heard. Now, I have to believe, and I guess it would be a little speculative, but I have to believe that the day that John breathed his last breath in this life, he could still hear fresh upon his ear the sound of the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ as he said, I am Alpha and Omega. I believe that those probably uh, rang out in his ears day after day after day as he recalled the things that that he had heard. But I wonder if the vision ever lost his sight. I wonder if in the back of his mind he could close his eyes and still bring into visibility the day that he saw the Lord. Can you imagine that? Would that not be wonderful? Can I tell you this spiritually speaking? I'm glad that I can close my eyes and go back to a time when I met the Lord Jesus Christ and it's still fresh and it's still sweet. It's still wonderful. It's still glorious glorious. It still reminds me that I'm saved by the grace of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm on my way to heaven, and one day, that which I've seen to be so glorious through the eyes of faith, one day I will see face to face, and what a day, what a day that is going to be. So we see being in the Spirit of the Lord's day will cause us to see things like never before. Notice what he saw. Verse number 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Number one, I want to bring your attention to this. John, in the spirit, on the Lord's day, saw the preciousness of the church. We find out in the last verse of this chapter there, verse number 20, uh, that the mystery of the seven stars, that was the seven angels of the churches, but the seven candlesticks were the seven churches. But I want you to notice he didn't just say they were seven candlesticks. He said they were seven golden candlesticks. Now we know gold throughout the Word of God speaks of deity and certainly we could say that it was God's church. It represented the Lord's church. It was not man's church. It was not created by man, not thought of by man, not produced by man, not kept by not man, not empowered by man. Everything the church has, everything the church is, everything the church ever will be, is because of the Lord Jesus Christ who is God. So therefore, certainly, deity does tie in with the church. But also, is it any wonder that he describes the churches as seven golden candlesticks in reference to something that he knew would be very precious to us? Is gold not precious? I, I mean, it's precious to me. Amen. So why is it so precious? Because it's so scarce around my place. Amen. I mean, if it was hanging on all the trees when I walked outside, I guess I wouldn't think much about it. But I will tell you this, if I went outside one morning and there was a gold block hanging from a tree, I'm going to run laps around my property after I pick it. <laughs> Amen. I know the crowd that I live around. Somebody drive through, drive through and see it. It's theirs. Amen. They wanna, I won't even know it's there. 
I'm going to shout the victory. Why? Because it, that would be a precious thing when you agree. I remember when we were grading for our property originally, we cut the driveway in and, and we were leveling the spot for the, the, the single wide there that we lived in for quite a few years. And as we were getting all of that ready, I, I remember sitting there as the grader was turning all that up thinking, Lord, please, this is Dahlonega. This is Gold Town. Lord, just let him turn up a nugget about the size of a car. Amen. I'm talking about the house. Pay. I retire right on the spot, all of that. You say, well, I, you don't know how pure it is. If it's the size of the car, it ain't got to be that pure. I thought, man, wouldn't that be wonderful if he just turned up and I, I remember walking, Brother Philip, and kicking dirt clods and breaking them apart just in case. Hey, man, I remember bending down and picking up. I guess it's what people call fool's gold. I remember every time something would catch my eye, I thought, man, alive, I'm going to be the first one to dig up a diamond in Dahlonega. <laughs> you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if something like that, because that is precious to us, it is of great value, it means something to us. And can I tell you, dear friend, it is no wonder that as God began to show a picture of the church, and now we know uh, in chapter number two and chapter number three, there are several pictures of the churches. We know that they're actual churches, and these are actual messages that were given to those churches that existed in all of those different locations. Also, not only were they uh, uh, applicable to the individual churches, but they're also applicable to our age today. There's a message to every church that would apply to this church. Amen. Uh, what about being cold and not, or what about being cold or hot? Not being lukewarm. Is that not still a great lesson for the church today? Amen. Hey, coffee's supposed to be hot. Amen. Tea's supposed to be cold. Glory to God. The ice is supposed to go in the tea. And, the, and, and it's not supposed to go in the coffee. And we've got a mixed up world today. You can go buy iced coffee. That's messed up. I know some of you like it, but you're weird. That's your problem. Hey Amen. Probably some of your greatest needs in this world is the fact you like iced coffee. It's weird. Hey Amen. And then some of you like to go to the Chinese restaurant. I will say this. I will drink hot tea when I'm at the Chinese restaurant, but that's the only time and only after I have loaded it down and it's almost crystallized with sugar. <laughs> and then I'm pretty sure it's no longer tea. It's just darkened sugar. And I'll drink it, uh, but, but I thought, you know, I remember sitting at Little Peking down here in Dawsonville, and I was drinking a cup of that tea. I said, man, I wonder if they'd bring me a glass of ice. Bring a glass of ice, pour the whole pot in there, about all the sugar they got on the table. I'm pretty sure I can show these folks how tea is supposed to be served. Cold or hot, now we've mixed it all and the lines have blurred. And, and, and I know that's a physical, silly illustration, but listen, spiritually speaking, we have blurred the lines down through the ages and God gave a practical message to the churches about many different things. And then there is the prophetic meaning of all those churches and it represents time frames in the church age and, and, and different periods of time that history would unfold and, and history would come out. And we We've seen those times, and now we're living in the day just before the coming of the Lord. What an exciting time that is. But, but John, when he sees the church, God shows it to him as seven golden candlesticks. Precious. Precious. Can I say this? If we'd get in the Spirit on the Lord's day, we'd begin to realize how precious church is. I wonder how many times we take for granted the church. I, I shamefully say it. I, I do it sometimes myself. I take for granted we have a church to come to. I wonder if we could talk to some underground church in China or underground church in Russia or some underground church in some country that, uh, where, where they don't have freedom to just worship the way that we do. I wonder if we spoke with them in the flippant attitude sometimes we speak about the church. I wonder how offensive it would be to them because they see how precious the church is. We don't very often realize how precious the people of the church are. 
We don't recognize many times how precious uh, the, the place of the church is. This is a precious place. Amen. I was here, man. Jeb came down early this morning. We came in to make a pot of coffee, and I just walked in here and stood up in the pulpit for a little bit and looked over the uh, congregation. I was blessed just by being here. Nobody was here. And I know there's no power in the walls. There's no power in the building. I understand that. But this is a place dedicated to the worship of the Lord. And not only is it a place dedicated, it's my place dedicated. This is my church. Amen. I don't mean that in ownership. I mean that in membership. This is my church. And you ought to feel the same way. This is my church. When I come to the house of God, I enter my church. This is where God has me. This is what he's provided for me. It's a precious place filled with precious people. And we take a precious book and we preach a precious word of precious truth. And we get together and we sing precious songs about our precious Savior. There's just a whole lot of preciousness when it comes to the church. Don't you love the church? So John, he saw the preciousness of the church. Second thing that he saw, being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, not only did he see the preciousness of the church, he saw the preeminence of Christ in the church. Notice verse number 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, that was the churches, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. We see that John, being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, saw immediately the preeminent position of Christ within the church. I wonder today if John was able to see in to many churches today if he would recognize them at all because of the lack of preeminence Christ has in the church. Now, we know we preach it around here a lot, and I try to stand on it. I hope you don't think I've wavered on it. I hope you know where I stand on it. Christ is to be the preeminent one in everything we do. We preach his gospel. Amen. This book is about Jesus Christ. We sing songs about Jesus Christ. We center the ministry on Jesus Christ. We witness about Jesus Christ. We talk about Jesus Christ. We teach about Jesus Christ. We pray about Jesus Christ. We testify about Jesus why? Because he is to have the preeminence in everything the church does. Not only did he see just the preeminence, but he saw he was preeminent in his glory. Notice the description that will give, or that the Word of God gives. Seven, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like in the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. There we have it again, that precious golden girdle. The precious gold that's mentioned again. Can I say this? He was, he was arrayed in glorious apparel. Glorious appearance. This is no ordinary sight. He didn't say, oh, there's Jesus in blue jeans and tennis shoes. No, don't knock, I'm not knocking blue jeans and tennis shoes. I praise the Lord for them. They're wonderful. Hey, Amen. I like to put on a pair of blue jeans and tennis shoes every now and then. But, but John here, he doesn't see Jesus in blue jeans. He doesn't see him in uh, some uh, Ber Bermuda outfit. Hey, Amen. He ain't got a flowery shirt on and, and Bermuda shorts and, and he sure ain't got spandex on. And somebody I say, glory to God, he ain't got gauchos on. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm, my goodness. I might ought to set the plow down. Amen. I got permission from one. I better not then. <laughs> I'm teasing. John did not see Christ in some casual manner. He saw Christ in his glory. He was in a glorious appearance. Can I tell you this? If we get in the spirit of the Lord's day, this Jesus being my buddy stuff would be kicked to the side. Thank God that Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But this business of Jesus being our buddy that goes through, you know, hands, hey, listen, a buddy hangs out where you want to hang out. And that's what you treat him like a lot of times. A buddy goes and does the things you want to do. Listen, Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And a friend a lot of times will grab you by the arm and say, Look, son, you ain't got no business being down there. I'm not your buddy. I'm not going to hang out with you down there. I'm telling you, you have no business. You come with me and we'll go somewhere else. That's what a friend will do. You ever had a friend you thought was trying to hurt you only to find out he was trying to help you? Amen. Praise the Lord. If we, if we would see Christ, if we would get in the spirit of the Lord today, we would see Christ in his glory. and He would not be some 
shadowy figure that we talk to occasionally. He would not be someone we joke about. He would not be someone we jest at. He would be the holy Lamb of God. And we would reverence Him and respect Him and adore Him and worship Him if we would get in the Spirit on the Lord's day and see Him preeminent in His glory. Not only was He preeminent in His glory, He was preeminent in His holiness. Notice verse 14. His head and His hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and His eyes were as a flame of fire. These two both speak of holiness. Of course, holiness represented in the color of white that wool, that snow, that represents something that's not been tainted with color, something that's not been tainted with dirt, something that is pure, something that is clean. Can I tell you when John saw Christ in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he recognized that is a holy Lamb of God. That is the holy Son of Man. That is the holy Christ. There's nothing unholy about Him. There's nothing tainted by sin, nothing tainted by the world. He was represented in holiness by the whiteness of His appearance. Parents, but then he said, what about that fire? One of the most purifying things in the world is fire. Still used today to purify gold, to purify silver, to purify metals of all sorts, to purify many different things, to purify water. Amen. You know, when, when pipes bust and, and there is the possibility of contamination to the city water system or the county water system, they will tell you that you need to boil your water before you use it. Why? Because when you put the fire to it and you put the heat to it, it burns out the impurities. It kills the things that will kill you. Amen. John, in the spirit on the Lord's day, saw Christ in his preeminent holiness and recognized he has a burning holiness, a refining holiness. Not only was he preeminent in his glory, he was preeminent in his holiness. Notice verse 15, he was preeminent in judgment. Verse number 15, his feet like in the fine brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Brass throughout the word of God is a symbol, a symbol of judgment. John, when he sees Christ in the spirit of the Lord's day, not only does he see Christ in his glory, not only does he see Christ uh, in, in his holiness, but he sees Christ in his judgment and he's in the midst of the church. This, we're living in a day where everybody said, don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. I'm so sick of people saying, don't judge me. Amen. Amen. Teenagers use it all the time now. Don't judge me, don't judge me. Amen. They get a bowl of ice cream. And you look at it and say, what you doing? They're going, don't judge me. I was asking you what you're doing. I'm not going to judge you. I want to enter in with you. It's ice cream. Hey, man. Somebody's, they, in fact, it's, I guess I'll just tell on them. Hey, man. Last night, Jeb come home. He ate supper with Brother Nick. He's a growing boy. And he ate supper at Brother Nicholas and Miss Samantha. As he got home, I told him how good our chicken was that I cooked on the grill. And he said, oh, really? Was there something left over? I said, yeah, there's something left over. He walks in the door, gets two chicken legs out, warms them up, and he's eating them. I said, you eating too? He said, don't judge me. <laughs> Amen. I, I didn't judge him. I had three. I'm not going to judge you about that. And so, but, but we use that term. We use it so often. And we say, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't, you know what we've done? We've looked at God and said, God, don't judge me. We've looked at the Lord Jesus and told him not to judge us. We've told him he has no right to judge us. We've told him he's had no right to rule over us. We've told him that his word will not stand in our lives. We're going to do as we please. We're going to do what we wish. We're going to go our own way. We're going to be our own man. Don't judge Judge us. It's not right to be judged. That's the society we're living in. But John, in the spirit on the Lord's day, saw Jesus represented in judgment. Amen. He's the judge. Amen. And he's the right judge. And he's the righteous judge. He's the holy judge that judges right and appropriately every time. He's never missed it, not once. Amen. In this society today, such a sad, sad thing. Nobody wants to be held accountable for anything. Stand in open rebellion and say that they've done nothing wrong when they know they've done things wrong, not only according to the law, but according to God's law. And I tell you, one day they will stand before a judge. 
and they will not be able to weasel their way out and there will not be a lawyer to represent them. Their crimes will be listed and they will stand naked before God without a word of rebuttal against the holiness and the judgment of Jesus Christ. He saw the preciousness of the church. He saw the preeminence of Christ in the church. But then I want you to notice this. He saw the proper attitude toward Christ in the church. Go with me in, in the scripture as we continue on down. Verse number 15. His feet like unto fine brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He, in the spirit on the Lord's day, John has the proper response to Christ being in the church. What did he do? He fell down at his feet and he didn't move until he touched him. I mean, that is, I guess if I had any, any desire coming to the house of God would be to lay still until he touched me. Amen. I'm talking about Brother Ken. Get in his presence so real and so thick where we see him in his glory. We see him in his holiness. We see him in his judgment. And we lay down at his feet and refuse to move until he touches us. I remember several years ago in a Jubilee meeting here at the church. Brother David was the pastor then. I, and uh, we, had, we were in a morning service. I don't remember who preached that morning. Trying to think, it may have been Brother Dwayne. May have been Brother Dwayne Moore. May have preached that morning. When he had preached, or whenever whoever it was had preached, there was a a hush. I'm talking about a silent, thick, heavy, holy hush that sat down on this place. And I remember Brother David was sitting here. I was sitting there, and there were several people, and no one budged. I mean, nobody moved. There was no going to the bathroom. There was no getting up. Nobody, nobody went to the, I mean, nobody, literally nobody moved. Nobody said anything. The only time silence was broken was when you'd hear somebody go, oh, oh. That was the only time the silence was broken. And I want to say probably 30 minutes we sat there in total silence with just an occasional moan once in a while. And then shortly after, it seemed that people began to go from a simple moan to, a, oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord. You, see, you know what he's doing, Brother Titus? We would laid there long enough. He's coming by. He's putting his right hand on us. Yes. Amen. And when he put his right hand on us, he began to speak to us. Amen. And things began to pick up. And, and I've never been in a service quite like that before. I've never been in one after that, just quite like that before. Been in some similar to that. But what a holy experience it was when we had the proper attitude of Christ being in the church. We like to see Christ come in. Because when Christ comes in, he makes us jump pews. Well, I'm not against that, man. If, if you want to jump pews and... God moves you to jump pews, jump them. Jump them. I encourage it for two reasons. One, if you're in the Spirit, it's going to be awesome to watch. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. And if you're not, it's going to be hilarious to watch. <laughs> so either way, I encourage it. Amen? Amen. I've seen people jump pews in both situations. We think, all right, man, we want Christ to come in because when Christ comes in, this place, I mean, it's going to get so loud. People are going to be shouting and running everywhere. It's going to get wild. I was watching a video, and, and I hope I don't offend anybody. I don't know who's watching, who's listening, or who will see this, but I was watching a video. I'll not mention any names, but it, it was a video of a church service where a preacher was singing a song, and, man, it got, it got wild. I'm just going to be honest. It got wild. Shortly thereafter, there was a man dove into the baptistry. I'm talking about the baptistry was full of water. He dove in the baptistry. And I, it was crazy stuff going on. I mean, just crazy. 
Now I wasn't there. Maybe if I'd been there, I would have been swimming with him. I don't know, Brother Titus. Maybe if I'd have been there, I'd have been running laps around the place. I don't know. I wasn't there. So it's hard just to watch a video. You're not in the spirit of the meeting. You're not, but I do know this. Somebody showed me that video. And as they showed it to me, he said, man, God was in that meeting. Maybe he was. I'm not going to say he wasn't. Please, I feel like I'm being critical. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to help us. A man diving headfirst into a baptistry may not necessarily be led by the Holy Ghost. He may be just extremely emotional. He may be extremely fleshly. I don't know. I'm not criticizing. Whoever the man is jumped in the baptistry, praise the Lord. If God was in it, man, that was a holy swimming lesson. Wonderful. But I looked at it and I thought, I don't know if God was in it or not. I, it wasn't bearing witness with my spirit necessarily. I will tell you this. I've been in some services where people were dissatisfied because nobody ran. But I felt like, Brother Ken, I'd been in the presence of the king. And I went home happy and satisfied in the Lord Jesus because I had been with him. Yeah. Nobody shouted. Nobody really ran the house. And listen, I, I'm not preaching. I'm all for that. You know me. I love running. I love shouting. I enjoy it. I like to see hands in the air. I like to hear it loud. Man, I enjoy being in meetings like that. But being loud and being animated does not necessarily mean Christ is there. Because John, in the Spirit on the Lord's day, saw Christ preeminent in the midst of the churches. And when he saw Christ in his holiness, in his glory, and in judgment, he fell at his feet as a dead man. He couldn't run. He couldn't shout. He fell at his feet as a dead man. I do believe there is a dimension of worship that goes far beyond the shout that many people never get to. And not, uh, not saying I've been there a lot, but I praise the Lord, Brother Ken, I have been past the shout a few times. Amen. And I, I like to stay in the shout sometimes. But sometimes God takes us beyond that. And the proper attitude toward Christ in the church, he fell at his feet and did not move until the Lord touched him. I read stories sometimes of men in, in olden days they would get in a church service and they'd call on a man to pray. A man would come to the pulpit and he'd say, let us pray. And after two hours of silence, without a word spoken, two hours, without a word spoken, he'd finally say, oh God, have we taken time to be holy? And then from that moment, after two hours of silence, a five or six word prayer, and the altar's filled with people getting saved, people getting right with God. And I wonder, there wasn't a shout. Nobody ran, nobody jumped pews. What they did was they saw Christ preeminent in the church, and they fell at his feet, and they didn't move until he touched them. Amen. I wonder, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to be in a church service where everybody was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Everybody. You know how it is. If you've ever moderated a service, you, some of you ought to moderate a service just so you can see what I look at. Amen. In every service, doesn't matter what's going on, Testimonies can be going on. There can be 75% of people weeping. There'll be somebody back there going. Hey Amen. You know what that tells me? There's at least one that's not in the spirit on the Lord's day. In every service. I've never been, I don't believe, in any service where every single person was absolutely under the influence and domination and permeated by the Holy Spirit in that service. But I'm telling you right now, if I never, if I never get to be in one before the throne room, I'll be in one one day. Amen. Amen. 
What a day it's going to be when the flesh is taken away and we gather with Christ and we worship without the bonds of this flesh without the cares of this life, because this life will be passed. What a day that truly is going to be. As we stand our feet tonight.